and we are live. Well, uh, good day. My name is Peter Ross. I'm speaking to the Canadian Chefs Congress. Delighted to be here. Uh, it's a nice sunny day in Vancouver. I wish I were there uh, with you in person, but uh, this is a, a close second. Um, I'm here to talk to you about uh, some of the research that I do and some of the uh, important things that I value uh, in uh, my professional world, uh, and that's the topic of ocean pollution. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you uh, very briefly about some of the study animals that I look at uh, out there uh, in the Pacific Ocean, but also the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans. I, I have worked on different projects around the world, uh, and certainly on all coasts of Canada. And Really, if I could uh, present this simple, simple question to you, I would say, what are these creatures telling us about ocean pollution? What are they telling us about what's going on in our coastal waters? And what are they telling us about the, the state of food webs, the state of pollution, or the health of the oceans, uh, otherwise put? And to me, uh, each of these species has a different story to tell, uh, depending on their biology and their ecology. And uh, you can well imagine that depending on what species we're talking about, whether you're cold-blooded or warm-blooded, whether you're at the top of the food chain, the bottom of the food chain, whether you're long-lived or short-lived, uh, all of these things have a tremendous amount of bearing on what types of pollutants you would be exposed to. Uh, and that makes my life, uh, well, maybe a little complicated, but also makes it really exciting because it allows me to work in partnership with these species uh, and, to, and allow them to help me tell the story about what's going on in our ocean. And uh, a conceptual approach I would present to you would be simply this. Uh, marine mammals and fish and any creature that we, we uh, describe in a study of ocean pollution is really serving as a canary. Uh, they're out there uh, sampling uh, their foods, their prey, their food web, uh, and anything I find in these uh, creatures uh, will uh, provide me a bit of a warning about what priority pollutants might be emerging out in the environment. And by priority pollutants, I'm referring to uh, chemicals perhaps that are escaping uh, regulation uh, or um, uh, we, we, we might find something unexpected uh, or we might learn that a certain chemical property is something that is bad because uh, a certain chemical might be persistent or might accumulate in food webs or, or might end up in a, a certain habitat. So these creatures in the ocean uh, working with me are serving as canaries just like um, canaries actually did in coal mines and other mines uh, uh, in, uh, over the last uh, 200 years or so. And that's because canaries were able to detect uh, carbon monoxide or methane gas before humans, the miners, succumbed to the toxic effects of those gases. And that's because the canary was more sensitive than humans. And uh, this early warning sign was good for the miners, good for occupational health and safety because it allowed them to escape. Not terribly good for the canary, of course, and therein lies a little bit of a, uh, a dilemma for me because I'm looking at some canaries, but I'm also hoping those canaries serve as an early warning so that I can help protect those creatures uh, and not only humans. So you might look at ocean pollution and say, we, we, we simply have to monitor the end of pipe discharges or smokestacks uh, or effluent and uh, understand what's going on um, in terms of the release of uh, these, uh, these different types of pollutants. And that is one way to look at what's being uh, released into the ocean. But if you actually think about a killer whale or a beluga whale uh, or a harbor seal or a sea otter or a salmon or herring, they're out there uh, accumulating uh, pollutants from many, many different sources. Some of these sources will be point source. Others will be what we call non-point source or diffuse uh, sources. Some of these pollutants might be uh, entering their environment from local sources, but other uh, pollutants can be transported many thousands of kilometers uh, from other parts of the world. So really when I'm looking at uh, these creatures, I'm looking at the cumulative effects of many, many different sources. Uh, and that's important if we're interested in conservation or natural resource management. It's also important when we look at chemical regulations because there are certain chemical properties that we run into uh, out there uh, that predispose animals to, to uh, often um, accumulating very uh, high concentrations of certain chemicals. And we have to inform regulators with this kind of information. So these marine mammals, seabirds, fish, whatever creature uh, is providing us with that sentinel service or serving as a canary, 
is helpful for me when I'm trying to uh, advise or guide decision makers, regulators, polluters, or community members who are out there uh, uh, trying to do their best as responsible homeowners. Um, many of you maybe don't realize that the term sewage or sewer comes from an old English term seaward uh, and that was uh, a term that was developed 150 years ago when uh, human health was suffering greatly from cholera and dysentery and a lot of problems related to uh, sewage not being evacuated from households and instead being disposed of in ditches, basements, uh, outhouses and other, other um, uh, sort of receptacles that were not uh, treating the sewage uh, nor that were they removing them from, from city centers or, or urban developments. So sewers were developed as a means to channel uh, these uh, human wastes to the sea and uh, that was a, a great benefit to uh, protecting human health but it was a problem in that it delivered it to coastal areas or streams and rivers and we eventually started seeing problems related to nutrification and uh, harmful effects on fish uh, and other non-point, uh, non-target organisms. So uh, sewers uh, to the sea solved certain problems, but it created uh, certain other problems. And the other big change, of course, is that sewage is very different today than it was 150 years ago. 150 years ago, we were primarily dealing with uh, human waste, and that is largely a nutrient uh, and a pathogen uh, risk to, uh, to receiving environments. Today, we have uh, sewage, which is delivering pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, artificial hormones, cleaning products, hydrocarbons, metals, uh, flame retardant chemicals, uh, and many other, other complex uh, chemicals, some of which are persistent, some of which are less persistent. But suffice to say that sewage uh, has gotten far more complicated uh, over the last 50 years, mainly since World War II, which was the start of our chemical uh, uh, revolution. And it means it, the job uh, for someone like me who is trying to study the impacts uh, associated with pollutants uh, in the marine environment has gotten a lot more complicated. I think this really goes a long way to uh, uh, really reminding us that it's important to have science, it's important to have monitoring, it's important to be fairly creative out there in the real world because the real world is a complicated place and we really need to be getting feedback from the creatures that are at the receiving end of, of these inputs. Um, I'll, I'll perhaps just shift to some of the persistent chemicals that we've run into over the last 50 years. DDT, PCBs, dioxins, these are three examples of very toxic chemicals that are highly persistent. Uh, they bioaccumulate in the fatty tissue of the food web uh, and they're toxic in that they can serve to disrupt normal endocrine processes in vertebrates. The classic example is DDT. DDT was a very persistent bioaccumulative uh, chemical that was used in malaria control or, or uh, insect control to present, prevent uh, malaria outbreaks in humans, but DDT also looks and acts like estrogen. So it disrupted the estrogen dynamics in seabirds that were heavily exposed to this chemical uh, because it fooled the female uh, seabirds into thinking that they had an adequate supply of natural estrogen to oversee uh, their calcium dynamics. Uh, and the, at the end of the day, what happened was eggshell thinning because they thought they had estrogen, uh, and, but they couldn't regulate DDT, they couldn't metabolize DDT. So this was a big problem. And what we've seen since the 1970s, following the discovery that DDT was uh, pervasive and leading to the extirpation of seabirds around the continent, uh, following the discovery that PCBs were being found in the Arctic and the Antarctic, uh, and following the discovery that pulp mills were releasing large quantities of dioxins and furans in the late 1980s because of the bleaching process associated with craft uh, products, Regulators stepped in. They said, we have science. Science coming from freshwater environments, science coming from the ocean, science coming from studies of wildlife. And we also have some laboratory evidence to, to strengthen the interpretation of what is happening uh, in some of the uh, creatures with regard to adverse effects. So the science supporting uh, some of the regulations and source control uh, led to um, uh, uh, or resulted in uh, improvements in the quality of uh, uh, the environment, led to dramatic declines in the presence of DDT in seabirds, 
uh, probably uh, an order of in the in the area of 10 times lower concentrations today in many uh, environmental components in Canada. PCBs down somewhere from two to five times in different environmental matrices in Canada. And dioxin releases down by about 95% from pulp mills. So that's, that's a, a wonderful example of how environmental sciences have really um, enabled source control, sometimes expensive, uh, but uh, highly effective in reducing the releases of these contaminants and ultimately the, the, the true uh, um, value of this kind of work is in uh, protecting aquatic food webs or ultimately seafoods for humans because if you think of those numbers a tenfold release in, in DDT concentration a two and a half to five fold uh, decline in the concentrations of PCBs um, and dramatic improvements or reductions in the concentrations of dioxins and furans. This means that uh, seafood products are far cleaner today than they were in the 1970s or the 1980s with regard to these three very important classes of persistent contaminants. So that's where science can be very effective and very important. I'd like to shift to um, something here that's very close to my heart and, uh, and probably close to the heart, hearts of many of you in the audience, uh, and that's talking about seafoods. This is, uh, to me, it's a bit of a hobby because I, I tend to be looking at, uh, at wildlife and endangered species, marine mammals, because I'm, I'm interested in delivering science to protect them. But if we deliver science that helps to ultimately protect uh, wildlife in our oceans, we are also delivering science that is going to protect the seafood uh, supply uh, for Canadians. And I think this is very important to, uh, to spend a minute talking about. Having clean and abundant seafoods uh, is important uh, commercially, it's important socially, it's important uh, nutritionally. And that's, uh, that's something that I think will not be lost on this audience. But I would like to, uh, to paint a, a picture whereby we, we look at the average Canadian uh, and the latest uh, values that I have for the average Canadian is that, uh, that we, uh, as typical Canadians, consume around five kilograms of seafood a year or aquatic foods. That would include freshwater and uh, marine products, about five kilograms per year. Not a great deal. We often call ourselves top of the food chain. We're actually omnivorous. That's not a great deal. Uh, but if we go and we start to look at some of the coastal Aboriginal communities, we see something very revealing. Uh, some of our own work here in British Columbia, uh, in around Victoria, Bella Bella, and multiple small communities around Vancouver Island, would indicate that uh, First Nations consumers are uh, taking in six to 14 times as much as the average Canadian. So up to 60 kilograms of seafoods a year. And 95% of these are harvested within community. They're not purchased uh, at a store or supermarket. And this means that we're connecting, or these people are connecting very directly with the health of the ocean. And of course, it also means that it's very important for us uh, to, to look at uh, pollutants that are getting into their food supply because I think that these are communities that are at greater risk of being exposed to some of these pollutants that do end up in uh, ocean food webs. Uh, finally, if we look at the Inuit uh, in uh, the Eastern Canadian Arctic, there's research done by others that would suggest they're, they're eating as much as 25 times much, as much seafood as the average Canadian. These values really underscore the importance of uh, ensuring that um, coastal food webs are protected from injury, uh, protected uh, for future generations, uh, and that we do our best to understand the types of pollutants that are entering in, into coastal uh, waters and how they're ending up in these food webs. Uh, and if we can uh, identify the problem chemicals and the sources of those chemicals, then we can act collectively to engage with regulators, decision makers, policy makers, uh, the manufacturing or the, the private sectors that might be releasing these or producing these, uh, these chemicals in the first place. So uh, when we do look at uh, Aboriginal communities, uh, I, I've, I've had uh, a number of uh, wonderful experiences uh, and to me the Aboriginal communities all around our coast uh, and that'd be about 70,000 individuals uh, here in British Columbia. They're really reminding me of how special uh, seafoods are to, uh, to us all. And I know that these communities are very concerned about pollution. 
but I also know how uh, conversations around seafood um, uh, within these uh, coastal communities uh, that are often remote uh, and suffering uh, terribly from economic and social hardships. I know that uh, food is a wonderful language, a wonderful tool for dialogue when one, talk, when one wants to engage with regard to such concepts as stewardship, natural resource management, taking care of one's own backyard, uh, and also uh, dealing with uh, nutrition and uh, economic uh, questions. So seafood, very, very important to coastal Aboriginal communities. But also a wonderful uh, confidence builder when one goes and learns about the, the old ways uh, and the current practices with regard to consuming some uh, rather unique uh, foods such as uh, sea urchin uh, uh, eggs uh, or, um, or chitin, steamed chitin or um, the fermented uh, uh, grease from oolican fish. Um, some very interesting flavors out there. Um, but also a wonderful uh, way to dialogue with uh, these important Aboriginal communities. Uh, uh, finally, I just want to touch on o ocean acidification because uh, there was uh, some interest expressed uh, to me via the Ocean Wise program and the, the Chef's Congress. Uh, this is a little bit outside of my uh, line of uh, specialty. I'm, I tend to deal with a lot of the man-made chemicals that, uh, uh, that are more complex and get into food webs and can persist in, in seafood products or marine mammals uh, and seabirds. But uh, ocean acidification is something uh, that goes to the heart of, uh, of our uh, life and our society uh, in Canada and around the world because uh, it's distinctly and uniquely uh, related to climate change in the sense that carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel uh, combustion uh, is increasing the concentration of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. And we can see from this plot an increase uh, from about 300 parts per million uh, in the, the mid-1980s to well over 360 and even up towards 400 parts per million today. This is the atmospheric CO2 concentration and as we all know this is a, a very significant threat to the stability of our climate systems and it's also a very important threat to a lot of our fisheries uh, resources because uh, some of them such as anadromous fish, salmon, uh, the many species of salmon that we have here in British Columbia are dependent on cold uh, riverine waters for reproduction and navigation and they're also dependent on an abundant food supply uh, in their own food web and that may be affected by warmer sea surface temperatures. At the same time as getting uh, increased CO2 uh, concentrations in the atmosphere uh, and potentially um, uh, associated with that uh, increased temperatures of the atmosphere and the ocean and the, the, the streams uh, that are uh, serving as salmon habitat, we're seeing an increased uh, dissolution that is uh, of uh, carbon dioxide in the upper layers of the ocean. That's, uh, that is that carbon dioxide or CO2 is dissolving in the upper layers of the ocean and that's forming carbonic acid. And carbonic acid is an acid is causing a decline in blue here on this on, uh, in this plot, a decline in the pH uh, of uh, the ocean. And uh, pH of the ocean uh, is log uh, scaled, uh, and the higher the value, the more basic, the lower the value, the more uh, acidic. So what we're seeing around the world and in certain coastal waters is a diminishing, a, a a reduction in the pH uh, value of the ocean, that is an increase in the acidity of the ocean. Having a slightly more acidic ocean uh, is proving to be a real problem to those creatures such uh, as uh, shellfish crabs or zooplankton that all rely on calcium to create and maintain their exoskeletons, uh, that is their, their shell. Um, so we're seeing big changes, uh, in some ways subtle but in some ways uh, 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 with potentially a very serious consequence with regard to the supply and reproduction of healthy populations of wild uh, invertebrates in the ocean. Uh, and some of the, uh, the aquaculture facilities in British Columbia and Washington State have been noticing uh, really serious problems with reproduction and growth of uh, the larvae of, of some of their uh, shellfish uh, products such as scallops. And they've been taking steps to manage this with um, by uh, adding lime uh, 
to, uh, to the, the water that is uh, serving to, uh, as nurseries for their, uh, their products. So, so they're taking steps to mitigate, but that's something that they're doing only for their aquaculture facility. Uh, really a, a bigger challenge for us all is trying to uh, stabilize and hopefully reduce the emissions of CO2 into the atmosphere because this is leading to ocean acidification and that will have consequences for the supply of uh, seafood uh, products in the form of uh, uh, shellfish and uh, other invertebrates. And finally, uh, uh, perhaps a no-brainer to, to many of us here today, but I, I really want to underscore uh, you know, the fact that we, if we're looking at trying to maintain healthy oceans for future generations, we're not just talking about reducing pollutants at the end of pipe. We're not just talking about sewage treatment for a certain city here and there. We're really talking about all of our activities uh, on land and at sea. Any activity that runs off into streams or rivers or lakes is going to make its way down into the ocean. Any, anything that gets emitted into the atmosphere is going to end up being transported to the ocean. And then we've got these creatures that migrate in and out of coastal areas, in and out of freshwater to marine environments. Uh, we really have uh, an interaction of, uh, uh, of multiple ecological uh, components. And I think uh, we, we, certainly it's a tall order to think that, we're, that we have to address all of these pollution sources. But it's important for us to be aware of how our own individual uh, activities, either at home or in a restaurant or a hotel or at our workplace, uh, it is going to have ultimate bearing on the health of uh, our oceans and ultimately the health of our seafood supply. And, uh, you know, conservation in this regard of uh, natural resources is something that will uh, provide uh, ultimately uh, benefits for both wildlife and humans, uh, whether uh, we're living on the coast or we're far from the coast. And, um, and that's just a little reminder of our uh, role here as scientists uh, at the aquarium as we uh, look ahead and try to uh, uh, document emerging issues, pollution issues, uh, and how we can uh, better empower uh, solutions in the future and hopefully uh, clean these oceans up for all of us. So thank you for, uh, for uh, listening to me today. Uh, happy to be here and thanks to the, uh, the aquarium and its uh, OceanWise program for uh, inviting me.